the beginning of the next part of this section from chapter 2 of Richard Thomas's book, Passion of the Western Mind, is called Astrology. In the classical world, however, mathematical astronomy was not an entirely secular discipline. For the ancient understanding of the heavens as the locus of the gods was inextricably wedded to the rapidly developing astronomy to form what was conceived of and considered the science of astrology, of which Ptolemy was the classical era's culminating systematizer. Indeed, a large part of the impetus for the development of astronomy derived directly from its ties to astrology, which employed those technical advances to improve its own predictive power. In turn, the widespread demand for astrological insight, whether in the imperial courts, the public marketplace, or the philosopher's study, encouraged astronomy's further evolution and continued social significance, the two disciplines forming essentially one profession from the classical era through the Renaissance. With the greatly increased precision of astronomical computations, the ancient Mesopotamian conception of celestial events indicating terrestrial events, the doctrine of universal sympathy, or as above, so below, was now placed into a more sophisticated and systematic Greek framework of mathematical and qualitative principles. This system was then applied by Hellenistic astrologers to render predictions not only for large collectivities such as nations and empires, but also for individual persons. By calculating the exact position of the planets at the moment of a person's birth, and by drawing out archetypal principles from the perceived correspondence of specific mythic deities to specific planets, astrologers derived conclusions concerning the individual's character and destiny. Further insights emerged by employing various Pythagorean and Babylonian principles pertaining to the structure of the cosmos and its intrinsic relation to the microcosm, man. Platonist elaborated on the means by which specific planetary alignments could bring about an assimilation of the planet's character within the individual, an archetypal unity between agent and receiver. In turn, Aristotelian physics, with its impersonal terminology and its, and its mechanical explanation of celestial influence on terrestrial phenomena, via the elemental spheres, provided an appropriate scientific framework for the developing discipline. The accumulated elements of classical astrological theory were brought by Ptolemy into a unified synthesis in which he cataloged the meanings of the planets, their positions, and geometrical aspects, and their various effects on human affairs. With the emergence of the astrological perspective, it was widely believed that human life was ruled not by capricious chance, but by an ordered and humanly knowable destiny defined by the celestial deities according to the movements of the planets. Through such knowledge, it was thought that man could understand his fate and act with a new sense of cosmic security. The astrological conception of the world closely reflected the essential Greek concept of cosmos itself. The intelligibly ordered patterning and interconnected coherence of the universe, with man an integral part of the whole. In the course of the Hellenistic era, Astrology became one belief system that cut across the boundaries of science, philosophy, and religion, forming a peculiarly unifying element in the otherwise fragmented outlook of the age. Radiating outward from the cultural center of Alexandria, belief in astrology pervaded the Hellenistic world and was embraced alike by Stoic, Platonic, and Aristotelian philosophers by mathematical astronomers and medieval physicians, by hermetic esotericists and members of various mystery religions. 
Yet the central basis of the astrological understanding was interpreted in different ways by the different groups, each according to its own worldview. For Ptolemy and his colleagues, astrologers, uh, astrology seems to have been regarded primarily as a useful science, a straightforward study of how specific planetary positions and combinations coincided with specific events and personal qualities. Ptolemy noted that astrology could not claim to be an exact science like astronomy, since astronomy dealt exclusively with the abstract mathematics of the perfect celestial movements, while astrology applied that knowledge to the necessarily less predictable and perfect arena of terrestrial and human activity. But while its inherent inexactness and susceptibility to error, error left astrology open to criticism, Ptolemy and his era believed it worked. It shared with astronomy the same focus on the orderly motions of the heavens, and because of the powers of causation exercised by the celestial spheres, astrology possessed a rational foundation and firm principles of operation, which, which Ptolemy undertook to define. In a more philosophical spirit, the astrological correspondences were interpreted by the Greek and Roman Stoics as signifying the fundamental determinism of human life by the celestial bodies. Hence, astrology was regarded as the best method for interpreting the cosmic will and aligning one's life with the divine reason. With their conviction that a cosmic fate ruled all things, and with their belief in a universal sympathy or law unifying all parts of the cosmos, the Stoics found astrology highly congenial to their worldview. The mystery religions expressed a similar understanding of the planet's dominion over human life, but perceived in addition a promise of liberation. Beyond the last planet, Saturn, the deity of fate, limitation, and death, presided the all-encompassing sphere of a greater deity whose divine omnipotence could lift the human soul out of the bound of the determinism of mortal existence into eternal freedom. This highest God ruled all the planetary deities and could thus suspend the laws of fate and liberate the devout individual from the web of determinism. Platonists similarly held the planets to be under the ultimate government of the supreme good, but tended to view the celestial configurations as indicative rather than causal, and not absolutely determining for the evolved individual. A less fatalistic view was also implicit in Ptolemy's approach, in which he stressed the, the strategic value of such studies and suggested that man could play an active role in the cosmic scheme. But whatever the particular interpretation, the belief that the planetary movements possessed an intelligible significance for human life exercised an immense influence on the cultural ethos of the classical era. The next part is Neoplatonism. One other field of thought sought to bridge the Hellenistic schism between the rational philosophies and the mystery religions. During the several centuries following Plato's death, in the mid-fourth century BC, a continuing stream of philosophers had developed his thought by focusing on and amplifying its metaphysical and religious aspects. In the course of this development, the highest transcendent principle began to be called the One. New emphasis was placed on the flight from the body as necessary for the soul's philosophical ascent to the, to the divine reality. The forms began to be located within the divine mind, and increased concern was shown for the problem of evil and its relation to matter. This stream found its culmination in the 3rd century AD in the work of Plotinus, who, by integrating a more explicitly mystical element into the Platonic scheme, while incorporating certain aspects of Aristotelian thought, formulated a Neoplatonic philosophy of considerable intellectual power 
and universal scope. In Plotinus, Greek rational philosophy reached its end point and passed over into another, more thoroughly religious spirit, a supra-rational mysticism. The character of a new era, with a psychological and religious sensibility, fundamentally different from that of classical Hellenism, was becoming apparent. For in Plotinus's thought, the rationality of the world and of the philosopher's quest is but the prelude to a more transcendent existence beyond reason. The Neoplatonic cosmos is the result of a divine emanation from the Supreme One, which is infinite in being and beyond all description or categories. The One, also called the Good, in an overflow of sheer perfection produces the Other, the created cosmos in all its variety, in a hierarchical series of gradations moving away from this ontological center to the extreme limits of the possible. The first creative act is the, in, is the issuing forth from the one of the divine intellect, or nous, the pervasive wisdom of the universe, within which are contained the archetypal forms or ideas that cause and order the world. From the nous comes the world soul, which contains and animates the world, is the source for all the souls of living beings, and constitutes the intermediate reality between the spiritual intellect and the world of matter. The emanation of divinity from the One is an ontological process which Plotinus compared to the light that moves gradually outward from a candle until it at last disappears into darkness. The several gradations, however, are not separate realms in a temporal or spatial sense, but are distinct levels of being, timelessly present in all things. The three hypostases, one, intellect, and soul, are not literal entities, but rather spiritual dispositions, just as the ideas are not distinct objects, but rather different states of being of the divine mind. The material world, existing in time and space, and perceptible to the senses, is the level of reality furthest from the unitary divinity. As the final limit of creation, it is characterized in negative terms as the realm of multiplicity, restriction, and darkness, as lowest in ontological stature, holding the least degree of real being, and as constituting the principle of evil. Yet it is also, despite its deep imperfection, characterized in positive terms as a creation of beauty, an organic whole produced and held together by the world soul in a universal harmony. It imperfectly reflects on the spatio-temporal level the glorious unity in diversity that exists, that exists on a higher level in the spiritual intellect's world of forms. The sensible is a noble image of the intelligible. Although evil exists within this harmony, that negative reality plays a necessary role in a larger design and ultimately affects neither the perfection of the one nor the well-being of the philosopher's highest self. Man, whose nature is soul in body, has potential access to the highest intellectual and spiritual realms, though this is dependent on his liberation from materiality. Man can rise to the consciousness of the world soul, thereby becoming in actuality what he already was, potentially, and thence to the universal intellect. Or he can remain bound to the lower realms, because all things emanate from the one, through the intellect and the world soul, and because the human imagination at its highest participates in that primal divinity, man's rational soul can imaginatively reflect the transcendent forms, and thus, through this insight into the ultimate order of things, move toward its spiritual emancipation. Um, part four uh, coming up.